Perfect. Okay, everybody. So what I've done to prepare for this is I've written you a really long review that's going to go over everything that we've talked about in the class, and then we're going to do questions. So that's where we're at. Got it? Let's get this party started. I am recording this, so if I repeat your question, it's just so the mic will pick it up. Got it? Because there's no microphone other than this one in this room. I feel like an idiot. It's whatever. Oh, hey, remember where we started our journey? Let's talk about what are data. So there are two big divisions in data type that we've been using this entire semester, and that has been quantitative, aka stuff that has units, and qualitative, also known as categorical data, that does not have units. Those of you who are furiously writing this down, I am posting this online just as a reminder, so don't waste your time writing, pay attention, unless I say something that you don't feel like I don't have up here. Anyway, a couple quick reminders about this. That's the big division. Does it have units or not? That's it. Yeah, And then the other thing that you want to do is be aware of, when I look at a categorical data piece or variable or whatever you happen to be doing, there are two big divisions amongst it. Ordinal, nominal. Remember, ordinal just means it has a natural order to it, like your grades. You know an A is better than a B. When you compare two values from it, you know which is the better one or a greater one based on what you're looking at. We only, and I'm going to say this more than once, we only do this to categorical. Only. Some of you, I remember, well, maybe not even from the, in this group, um, keep trying to do ordinal and nominal to quantitative stuff. Quantitative stuff is numbers. We know the order with them already. You know when a number is greater than the other. There's no point in talking about this. They already are all ordered. So keep that in mind. We only do this to categoricals. Wow. Anyway. Once we knew what data types are, we started down the journey of, oh no, now that I have something that's categorical, how can I organize it in a useful way? And we came up with two ways of summarizing that, one of which was numerical, and the other which was visual. visual. <clears throat> so we have two different types of charts. I remember these because chart starts with a C, and so does categorical. You really shouldn't try to chart anything who isn't categorical. I've given you an example of the way we numerically summarize these up into the right. Those are tables. That's the best you can do with a categorical variable. You can either look at its frequency or relative frequency. Remember, anytime you're doing relative frequency, you're dividing out by some sort of total. You might not necessarily be doing a you know, column total like I'm doing here. We also did row totals and some other types of totals. Do you remember the total of totals or overall total? Yeah, I got one of those coming up. Cool. So that's how we summarize categorical data. Then we moved on to quantitative. And we said, oh my gosh, this is so much more complicated. How can I summarize this? And then we came up with some of the same things. One of the things that you might want to keep in mind about statistics is there tends to be three things to everything. So when it comes to looking at graphs of quantitative data, you're like, oh, there's three things I need to tell you. Shape, center, spread. Just as a reminder, here's some common shapes that we've talked about. Yay? Uh, it's whatever. Um, we also had box plots, which is another common graph. We really only did two graphs for the quantitative variables as well. There are other ones out there. We didn't do any of them because they're not really used for anything. OK, shapes done. How about centers? Do we remember the two centers? Mean and median? Yeah. There was something very different about them when you had data that had something that was unusual in it or unusually different from the rest of the data. Sometimes those were outliers. Sometimes they were just, sorry, outliers. Sometimes those were things that were just, you know, a little unusual compared to everybody else on average. Yeah, but either way, they were different from the center, the mean. When you have that happening, your mean gets pulled towards an unusual value. The example I usually do with you guys is like, oh my gosh, if we're talking about average height, pretend a giant jumps in the joins our classroom, then we know that, hey, our average is going to get higher, but our median might not because it only cares about order, not size. It splits the data in 50% below and 50% above. So one of the things we talk about is we say that it's sensitive to the extreme values when we look at the mean because it gets pulled towards them, but the median is not. So if you know you have something that has extreme values or outliers, you really should only use one of these, the one who doesn't get as affected by these unusual values, and that's the median. <sighs> okay, spreads. Oh, hey, there's three of them. I don't know. Standard deviation we know is average distance from the mean. We think of this as like our way of measuring how far away something is from average. That's one thing I keep talking to you about. Just because something is different doesn't mean it's significantly different. 
No? Okay. You guys are going to talk to me today. That's fine. Ah. <sighs> Recently, I've gotten lots of assignments and quizzes and tests from everybody where you'd be like, oh, well, 11%, that's less than 13%. Okay. Yeah, but that's only a 2% gap. If your spread is 8%, yeah, they're close. But if your spread is a quarter of percent, those are really far away from each other. It's not just how far apart are they, but how you're measuring your distances. So don't forget about standard deviation when you're trying to decide if something's unusual. The usual rule of thumb for that is use the z-score if you don't know. I have asked you on every single test since we encountered the z-score, is this unusual? I'm not trying to like untelegraph this. There's going to be a z-score on there where I ask you, hey, is this, you know, really different from the rest of the data? And your answer will either be yes based on the z-score or no. Okay. Uh, remember, to be an unusual z-score, you need to be two away or more. And anything bigger than three away from the center is like really unusual. And when I say three away, I mean in either direction, from negative three to positive three. Good times. That's what it is. Anyway. Oh, hey, let's talk a bit about standard deviation, because I'm a little worried about this. So in this pretty picture I have for you, I have four sets of data that all have the same mean, but different standard deviation. I really want to stress that standard deviation seems to be the part that people are having difficulty with. And it's really important. How am I spread? So if you look at this first graph, my spread is zero, because all my data is the same value. So it all has the same mean, and they're not spread from each other. You can have zero, but it's a distance, which means you can't have negatives. OK, so look at this one. It's like, oh, some of my data you know, is it's all kind of like mm, tight together. You know what I mean? Yeah, everything's pretty close to the mean. And the most frequently occurring value is right at the mean. So my spread is kind of small. And then you look at the next one up, and I'm like, oh, well, there's the mean. But most of my data isn't at the mean. They're right next to it, but it's not like real, real close to it. So my spread got a little bit bigger. And this one is probably the more extreme of these three, scenari three scenarios. Sorry, four. I can count today. Um, I've got some data at the mean. And then I've got most of my data is far away from the mean. How far is it? Well, about three on average. Hence why it came out about three. Yeah. So as you get more data further away, the bigger the standard deviation is going to get. Because it's average distance from the mean. Look at the following distribution. Let's come up with its summary. So you should be thinking, what shape is this? Where's the center about? And what spread would you assign this? Oh, no. What shape is it? Skewed left, what else? You said it already, okay, unimodal. I'm repeating you so people can hear this if they watch the video. Sorry if that seems rude. I sound like a parrot, let me just repeat what you say. I don't even think I wrote down unimodal, but it is. Oh, I did, yay, okay. I said the center is about uh, 273. So I look at this and I'm like, oh, if I use the median, I wanna have about half of my area on this side and half on this side, so it's probably real close to right here, is my guess, because I got some values down here. You know what I mean? Okay, you may or may not estimate slightly differently from me with this one, but you shouldn't be saying, oh, well, it's got to be at the peak, because that's not necessarily true when I have so much of it showing up at the tail. So when you're thinking about the median, think in terms of area. I want to imagine that I want to split this in half so that if I wanted to color one side of it with a crayon, I'd use the same amount of crayon as I used on the other side, or paint, or whatever you like to color with. I said the IQR is about 50. I was guessing that about you know, here I say my middle is, and then I'd say about half of it's about this far to this far away from it. So that's about 50, roughly about from 30, 239 to 289. It's about 50. You're estimating here for the middle 50%. There is no math behind that. But you should know how to calculate an IQR if I give you data, right? Yay, mini tab? Or use it by hand? If it was a data set that was this big, please do not do it by hand. Yeah? No? Okay. Moving on. <sighs> Let's look at another example. So these are pulse rates for uh, smokers after they jogged, I think, three miles or something like that. Hmm. Some of them are more scary than others. I don't know. I don't know how much running you guys do. No. I was actually surprised how, like, None of them were like, I'm dying and my heart's exploding. I don't know. It is what it is. Um, 
For this type of data, our typical way of organizing it would be to use the five number summary. Do we remember what's in the five number summary? Oh no. I'm, I, I don't know if anyone can hear you. It's okay though. No, it's okay. The mean is not in there. It is Q3. What else? Yep. Okay, you got all five. So min, first quartile, median, third quartile, max. I believe in my heart of hearts you guys know how to do this because if you're not sure how to do them by hand, what you do is you just type them all in there and use descriptive statistics and mini tab to do this. Do we remember that? I hope. A couple reminders. When you're doing quartile range, sorry, interquartile range, you know, you just take the third quartile and subtract the first quartile. It happens to be 18 in this case. The next thing you should always ask yourself when it comes to organizing this is that, do I have anything unusual? And if you're using the five number summary, what you should use to do that is one and a half above the third quartile and one and a half below the first quartile. So in this case, so that's my third quartile. There's my IQR times one and a half. So this is like 150% away from the middle 50%. That's 105. My biggest is 90, so we're good. And then for the lower part, you know, I got my lower quartile, Q3, 60, plus 150% of the inner quartile range, which is 18. And that's 33. Yeah, so nobody's below 33, so this is good. There's no unusual me measurements in here, which I'm glad, because if, I don't know, if you're below 33, I think you might be dead. Um, I think you can get above 105 and be just fine, right? That should be good. Like, I think I've been up to like 145 when I was doing athletic activities with surviving still, unfortunately. Or may, wait, that was the wrong word. Anyway, sorry. After we got done with one variable each, we did two variables. I know I'm going through this fast. It'll be okay. Oh, we looked at linear regression and we said, ooh, I got some data. And then the first question we asked ourselves is, are these related? And we use scatter plots to decide that. Then we asked ourselves, oh, if it looks like they're related, how can I express the relationship? And that was all about let's build an equation. Once we had an equation, we wanted to ask ourselves, is this accurate? Does this tell me something about what's happening on? Can I use this to predict something? I'm pointing at this. I should use the mouse, sorry. Can I use this to predict something? And then the last thing we did is, oh, how good is my prediction? That's when we started looking at residuals, which are how far was my prediction from the truth? Yep. Now, don't get mad at me because I know I'm supposed to teach you business statistics, but I'm running out of data to use, so I stole some from a friend of mine who's a biologist. Let's look at bears. Sorry. I like to give you real data because then you get real scenarios of what's happening. So if you look at this data, it's like, oh, man, there's like how much they weigh versus how long they are. Notice it's length of the bear, not height, because that would be weird. I don't know. It seems like this one's reasonable for its size, right? So you look at this and you're like, oh, I wonder if these are related. Is the bear's length related to its weight? We do height and weight with humans. Why not with bears? It's fun. Um, <laughs> so typically what we do is we gather our data, put them in a scatter plot like this, and ask ourselves, what does the association look like? And association, please remember, is different from correlation. You shouldn't try correlation until you're already sure that it looks linear. Polite reminder. So we really should do association first. So you ask yourself, oh, what's the strength? What's the direction? Do I have a form that looks linear? Do I have any outliers? And those last two are the most important, which is why I put them last. I know we've used the mnemonic FODs to remember this, which is kind of dumb sounding, but whatever. Um, but the idea is that, hey, if I have a linear form and I have no outliers, I should be able to try regression on this, provided I don't have too much scatter. If you can see the form, there's not too much scatter. If you have a hard time seeing what shape it's making, the form, it's probably got too much scatter for you to try this. Yeah, so remember when we describe strength, it's in terms of how much scatter do I have? Do I have a strong relationship so there's less scatter? Do I have a moderate relationship? So I can still see the shape, but I've still got some spread out between my points. And then weak is like, I really don't know if I can tell what's going on at all. This one, I didn't give you really enough data, or sorry, I wasn't able to acquire enough data for you to get a good idea of what's happening. But I look at this, I'm like, oh, I got a grouping here and a grouping here. It looks kind of linear, like maybe it's like this. I don't know, I, ha I don't have a lot of short bears, so this is hard, or l around 200 pounders. So, you know, I gotta make more bears, more foods. Anyway, um, and as a polite reminder, 
correlation really should only be used if you think it looks linear, and only you can do that. There's nothing that automatically does that for you. And when you look at correlation, it only describes the strength of the linear relationship between these two. So, you know, it doesn't tell you anything else. It just tells you, should I do this if it was a strong enough relationship? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Correlation, you can can, can, can all you want, but you don't, won't always should. Anyway, these equations are on your formula sheet, so, you know, go crazy. Um, remember, they're a little weird. Just a couple of reminders about this. Y hat stands for predicted Y. It's the one that comes off your line, not off your data. B0 is part of your intercept. B1 is your slope. And then X is just your X variable. So we have called these the predictor X and the response Y. R is correlation. Yeah. And then SY, that's standard deviation of the Y variable. SX is the standard deviation of the X variable. Bars represents mean, so this is the average for the y, average for the x, there's the slope. So we always find slope first. This is just like when you did it in algebra. Um, when it comes to doing this, you have two methods for doing this. You can either use Minitab or you can use these formulae. Whichever one you want, they're going to come up with the same result. Just be careful and don't round too much and you should be fine. I highly suggest using Minitab for this because I think it's easier. You push two buttons, you're done. Go back. Um, <laughs> this should be pounds. Sorry about that. That is definitely a typo. You plug in 60, find the value. And then residual, as you remind yourself, is just the error. So it's the actual minus predicted. You take the actual weight of, or sorry, the actual weight of the bear. I still wrote inches again. And then subtract it and get 14.6 pounds, which actually isn't that bad for measurements. Here's the one I want to get to because I'm anxious. <sighs> Given that you have the equation, what does the slope mean? What's the interpretation of the slope here? The slope is the, you know, 9.66. Oh no. I've asked this one a lot. You should kind of expect it to show up. No? Oh no. That's why we're here to review. Ready? The trick I taught you is set it up like a ratio. Remind yourselves that this is your change in your y variable, which in our case is white, weight, Wait, Whew. white, white bears. There are no white bears. Oh, no, wait, that's the ghost bear. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, polar bears too. I fail. Um, <laughs> over your change in X, rise over run, all that jazz. So it's how my weight changing in response to my length changing. So as you look at this, instead of writing 9.6 on the other side, because that's what my slope is, I do 9.6 over 1. That was the trick, divide by 1. And then think of it as a ratio. So how much is my weight changing? 9.66, and that's in response, because that's my response variable, to my length chasing, changing by 1. So when you write that as a sentence, think about it as like, oh, if my length changes by 1, my weight responds by changing by 9.66 pounds, because that's what the units are for weight. So if you write that in a sentence in context to what's happening, which is what an interpretation should look like, oh, hey, if my bear grows 1 inch longer, it will weigh 9.66 more pounds. It's just a one, yo. And it's not silly because dividing by one gives you the same number, so I've changed nothing. It's making my head itch. Anyway. Remember, the slope always has meaning. You should always be able to interpret the slope. It's always going to give you something, some bit of information about what's happening. And then there's the intercept. Please remember that the intercept has two parts. I know that a lot of you left algebra thinking, oh, the intercept's just the negative point... Sorry, not point. Negative 352. But that's absolutely not true. It's the value you get when your independent variable, which in our case is the predictor length, is zero. So there's two parts. It's when one is zero, the other does, well, stuff. So you should be thinking of this as the point zero, negative 352. If you're ever worried that you don't get your points in the right order, remember the x goes first and the y goes second, just like the alphabet. And in my case, my x is length. Boy, this mouse does not work at all. And then my weight is negative 352, because things can totally weigh negative pounds. I wish, says the fat lady. All right. A bear that's zero inches long weighs negative 152 pounds. No, wait, 352. You know this is nonsense, right? It, it, yeah. 
We saw this happen quite frequently. Sometimes your intercept tells you absolutely nothing about what's happening with your variable data. <sighs> it's unfortunate, but true. I hope that didn't come off as a big blustery noise. So as you look at this, remember the intercept also can sometimes mean something. We looked at some book data this semester where the covers of the books were what the, you know, zero was, page, zero page book had like centimeter in stuff things, words. Oh, better one. We had the cars where it was like, oh, this is the price of a brand new car because its age was zero. Yeah. And we also had the, um, what was the other one we did? Uh, experience and how much you should be paid. So this is what you would get paid if you were just starting and had no experience at your job. Those were some other ones we've done where this makes sense, but sometimes it doesn't. Yay, chapter four. Bye-bye. Let's talk about probability. Our basic rule of probability is if I want to figure out how something happens and how often it happens, I can do that two ways. I can count it and think about it real hard, and that's called theoretical. Wee. Or I can do an experiment. That's called empirical. Regardless of that, what I'm really doing is I'm looking at the number of ways A occurred over everything that happened. So I've got two of these on here that help. So you throw a die 100 times and count how many threes you get. It happens 15 times. So you're like, oh, it's 0.15. You know. Or you can be like, OK, there's one three on the dice out of six. So that's one six, which I rounded so you could compare these two. Clearly, they're not the same. This is how it goes, too. Thinking deep thoughts about something is not the same as going and experiencing it. Just saying. Life advice. Stats. Eh. And then we had some other rules. If you want to not do something, that's the opposite of doing it. Yay, probability. Remember my pro tip of this is, you know, if you're having a hard time figuring out the probability of something, try doing the opposite of it and then subtracting it from one. Remember that all probabilities must be between, be between 0 and 1. When you get 2, you know you did something wrong. When you get a negative, you know you did something wrong. Watch out for this. When you're doing your calculations and doing your home, no, nope, homework doesn't work anymore. You're saying goodbye to that. <laughs> when you're doing your test, if you get something that just doesn't seem right in your probability, recheck yourself before you wreck yourself. Here's a silly example for you of same things that are disjoint. The colors on this did not come out very correct at all. That was not black and white. <sighs> I got to have like one fail per PowerPoint, right? Here it is. Sorry. Uh, okay, so being different colors is obviously a disjoint event. You can't be both except for the color teal, which my husband argues is green, and I argue is kind of blue, but also green. What is teal? It's messing with my brain. That's what it is. So... <laughs> <laughs> if two events are disjoint, you can just count the ways they happen individually when you do an or, but you have to be careful because that's not always the case. If you don't have things that are disjoint, you have to be really careful about how you count. This time I used numbers. That was safer. I should have did that the first time too. Okay, so I have my box. So imagine you're going to draw some numbers out of this box and you're like, oh, I've got two events I'm interested in. One is, hey, is it even? And uh, B... I just said one. A, is it being even? B is, A, I got a number greater than five. These overlap. There's some stuff that's going to get counted twice. There are even numbers that are bigger than five in here. Okay, so what should A or B be? Well, if you count up all the ways this can happen, it's going to come out like this. But, you know, you're like, how do I figure that? So you're going to count A, and you're like, oh, what are the ways I can be even? Zero I'm counting as even. Anybody offended by that? It behaves like an even. Two, four, six, eight. How do we appreciate everything? We do math. What are the ways I can be bigger than five? Six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, what do they have in common? Six and eight. So I counted those twice, once here and once here. That's why we subtract the overlap. A couple of you have been subtracting double the overlap. That means you're taking them away completely. Do not do that. They're definitely still there. There's seven out of 10 ways that this could happen. Please remember with an or, don't assume there is no overla overla overlap unless you know it's there. <clears throat> no, it's not there. Eh, thanks. Hey, we did stuff with tables. I'm going to go through this one real fast. Usually with the tables, you guys were fine when it came to doing things on the margins, so on the edges. So like figuring out if a stranger is going to attack you. Sorry, crime data is easy to get. I hope this isn't too scary for you guys. You're like, oh, I use this total because it's on the margin out of all the total, the overall total. Or if I want to figure out if it's a robbery, I use this total out of that one. Where things get hard is where you look at a stranger robbing you. Oh, that's this uh, one in here. And then divide by the total. 
But be careful if you want to look at a stranger or being ro at being a robbery. Just like the previous example, if there's ways this can overlap, you don't want to count the overlap too much. So if you're like, oh, I got to do just being, you know, a rob being robbed and it being a stranger minus the overlap. Don't forget about the and, yo. It's the one that screws everybody up. Yep. Oh, and. What if I want to do repeated events? This is when you multiply. So I'm going to, nope, I can't back up on this, not and get it to record, sorry. <sighs> Don't multiply unless you know for sure things are independent or more than one thing is happening. So in the previous example, I was like, hey, let's figure out the probability you were robbed or you were robbed by, or it was a stranger who committed the crime. This is talking about one person having that happen. It's very different from, oh, what's the probability the next six months you're gonna get robbed twice? That's totally different because something is happening more than once. In that case, yes, you can multiply, but it turns out there are a couple different ways you can multiply based on things being independent or not independent. You just gotta be careful. Okay, and then there's the one that makes everyone angry. <sighs> Remember, a conditional probability is looking at the probability of something given that something already has happened. So event, in the way I've written this, is event B is the one that already happened. So we call this A given B already happened. This would be, for the robbery example, like, what's the probability you're going to get robbed a second time given that you were already robbed once? Those are different. And if you know for sure they're in, they have no relationship whatsoever, aka they are independent, then knowing about B is irrelevant and you'll just end up with the probability of A. Not everything is independent. Don't assume independence. If you're not sure if it's independent or not, don't assume it can be, because you all know what assuming does to people's. I don't want to be the one who's that. I'm, I'm kind of not okay with you either. Anyway, bad jokes. This is already half an hour long, that's not good. The next slide is blank for no reason. Nope, we're good. Hey, find the probability that when you're drawing two cards, you get um, a couple different events. I'll just go through this. A, you get an ace on the first try. So four out of 52. You get a king on the first try. Four out of 52 again. Okay, they're the same, but not the same because like, you know, they're different events. And then drawing an ace, then a king. This is where you can multiply. But notice in particular, that second event is different than what you would have expected. So I drew an ace first, right? So there's my ace, four out of 52. And then I drew a king. But isn't a king four out of 52? What? No, it's not. Something happened in that first event that caused the second event to change. Do we see the difference here? Yeah. That's because they're not independent. What happened with the first one had an effect on the second. Not independent in big capital letters because I'm scary. Oh. Well, there's a thing I already said. Anyway. Ask yourself, is what's happening going to have an effect? If the answer is yes, you cannot assume independence. Anyway, here's one where you can totally get away with it. Draw a thing out of the box. The G stands for goods. The D stands for defective. And then you draw a second one, and you're like, oh, but I put it back in there. Replacement fucks everything up. I thought I wasn't going to swear during this because I want to post it publicly, so that's not going to work. Oh, well. YouTube's going to ban me. Hey, if it's replacement, you should go ahead and assume they're independent because doing the second draw, the second event, is exactly the same as doing the first because nothing has changed. The scenario came out exactly the same. Ah. Replacement is your friend. No replacement, no friend. Think about the cards, man. I didn't put the cards back in the deck. So, you know, that's where it is. In general, when you're thinking about drawing two things, don't assume you're grabbing two at once. Even if you assume you're grabbing to it once, it behaves like not replacement because you're not putting one of the cards back in. So if you're not sure if it's replacement or not, ask yourself, could this been a two-step process? And if the answer is yes, and what was happening in the first event is not the same as the second, it definitely didn't include replacement. And then it's not independent. Anyway. Um, just a reminder, if you have repeated events where none of the trials are affecting each other, aka if I ask you all, hey, go quit smoking. Let's just assume none of you smoke because this is horrible. And I tell you, hey, this hypnotist is ex very successful at this about 60% of the time, which is actually pretty good for, you know, smoking, in case you guys didn't know. No? 
Don't smoke. It took my dad 30 years to quit. 30. It's ridiculous. Anyway. Eh. If they have no effect on each other, you can multiply. Do you remember what we call this? No? Don't say binomial or geometric because it's neither. Hey, if it repeats, I can multiply. <sighs> Last thing about probability. Just as a reminder, we have discrete and we have continuous events. So far, I've done nothing but discrete ones. Remember, continuous stuff feels like infinity. Measurements with no gaps. Discrete doesn't feel that way. You can definitely count it. If you can't count it, it looks like infinity. Blarg. Oh, hey, here's something that you can count. So a couple of reminders about probability distributions. Total area must be one. All events must have a probability. All the probabilities have to be between zero and one because that's all a probability can be. And then if I want to find the expected value, that's just every value plus how likely it is, sorry, times how likely it is, all added together. That's exactly what this formula means. We... And then the standard deviation is much more complicated. It's how far I am from the mean squared times how likely I am. Add them all together because you've got to include all of them. Then take the root because the square makes things too big. This was the thing we did using tables because it was complicated. Oh boy. Here's the correct answer to that one. I'm not doing it. If you need practice on this, me showing you how to do it is not going to help you. You repeatedly trying it yourself and practicing so you know what all the steps are, that will help you. Let's talk about the binomial and the geometric. I don't know where I'm doing it. Oh, hey, if you have a fixed number of times you're going to try something, and they're all the same probability, think the smokers, um, each trial is independent, and you have two categories, either something that you consider a success and something you consider a failure. When you take that into account, you have something that looks like a binomial. Here's some crashed planes. I don't know. I'm now going to read this out loud for fun. Hey, domestic flights. We're going to look at four, uh, four out of seven being from USA Air. Um, according to this definition, we know N, P, and Q, and how many times it's going to happen. That's four. Remember when you're using the calculator to do this, the calculator, come on you, only does less thans. So if you want to do a greater than, at least four, you've got to do one minus three because it's discrete. You can only get whole numbers. This is not the same as continuous, so you have to subtract. If you're not a calculator person, ah, that was not supposed to happen. Just use Minitab. I don't know why that happened. All right, good times. Um, <clears throat> just as a reminder, the normal approximation of the binomial says, hey, if I don't want to do the binomial, I can do the normal, as long as I have at least 10 successes and 10 failures. Eh, you don't really need the variance. I shouldn't have included that. But when you do so, the, uh, the uh, mean is going to be the number of successes times the probability of being successful, and the standard deviation follows the following. We didn't really use this for much of anything, so meh. There's how you'd use it to do the crashes one, if you want. You don't have to. They both come out about exactly the same. I'm not, I, uh, we talked about this, don't worry about it. What? You've been warned. Hey, let's talk about the normal distribution. Don't assume things look normal. There's lots of things that look normal. Maybe not your friends. I don't know. <sighs> Why do I teach such a dry subject? Anyway, so a couple reminders. There's a thing called the standard normal distribution. I've put them on here in red, but I've also included this blue guy, this green guy, and this yellow guy. I stole this from Wikipedia Commons, but it's also someone you're allowed to take because it has free use policy, so yeah, that works. Um, where was I going with this? Not all standard normals look the same. Please keep that in mind. They, they look different based on what is your mean, what is your standard deviation. So you know, don't assume everybody's mean zero and standard deviation one because that's the one we use the most. However, that is the one that is on the table. Polite reminder, I'll give you the table. Don't bring it. That's all I had for that one. What? Meh. Oh, hey, you should know what these words mean. I don't know what else to say about this. If you don't know these words, you're going into the test, you're probably going to have some troubles. I would say the biggest thing to watch out for is make sure you know the difference between all the biases and all the samplings methods. Samplings method? Yeah, whatever. In particular, the one that people tend to get the most confused is clustered and stratified. I put them on the bottom on, on purpose. 
And the other thing that people tend to get wrong or confuse is when they see a stratified, they notice that it has randomness in it and they think it has a simple random sample on it. No, part of doing the stratified method is to randomly sample from the groups that you create. So that's not a new thing or a multi-stage sampling method. That is the method. Now, if they decide randomly they're going to just do another random sample off of the strata that they have, that's kind of pointless. But, you know, that would be a multi-stage. Cluster is, remember, after you've made your groups, pick a whole group. Whole group. No random sampling involved. You just pick one of them. I guess you could do that in a random fashion, but whatever. Um, eh. What else do I want to say? Voluntary is probably the most common, but it's also like the worst one because it automatically gets voluntary response bias. This is boring. I know, but I want to make sure I talk about everything at least once. Oh, hey, inference for proportions. I'm hoping you notice that I spent more time on this stuff from the beginning because it's the stuff you did like the least recently. But it also seems easier now because you've been doing this longer. You know how to make a graph. You know how to do a mean. It's like, this, yeah, I don't know. It is what it is. Um, <coughs> my voice is not doing so good. Hey, remember, the proportion one looks different from the mean one. There it is, done. We do two things on this. Confidence intervals, hypothesis tests. When you're doing a hypothesis test, that's all about testing a claim. When you're doing a confidence interval, it's trying to estimate the population parameter. Okay? That's what you're trying to estimate. So those of you who keep writing things about samples, no, you're estimating the parameter. You're using the sample to make a prediction about what the rest of the world is doing or whatever your population happens to be. Don't forget that. It's all about what do I think is happening for everybody else. And whoever of you who went to the guest speaker that was horrible, <sighs> that's like the big thing he got wrong. <sighs> yes, we use this to make predictions. He kept on saying, oh, we need to make predictions. You don't need the mean for that. Oh, hell yeah, you do. <sighs> Ugh. Sorry about that. Oh, here's an example. Any of you gotten a photo ticket? I don't know how popular those are in this state. I haven't lived here long enough. Uh, oh, were you like, uh, if you speed and you get caught by the photo, you got caught by the photo? Oh. I've only gotten caught once, but it wasn't me driving the car, and I was, like, super happy. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, they mail you the ticket. It's really annoying. Because, like, you know, it's like getting caught, but, like, you feel, it feels not fair, you know? It is what it is. Anyway, so Minnesota, these are super popular, by the way. Same with Wisconsin and a couple other northern states where they just have fewer cops but want to catch people. I think the Dakotas are like this, too, but I haven't been out to one of them in a long time. Um, Anyway, what was I saying about this one? So in Minnesota, these uh, are prevalent but not popular because only about 51% of the people, you know, think they're not okay. Wait, that was backwards. 51% of people are opposed to them, so slightly more than average. What proportion of adults do you think are going to be opposed to them? So here's the thing. You can do this by hand. It'll be okay. What do you do first? Collect your information, get your standard error, and then set up your confidence interval. Don't forget your margin of error is your z-score times your standard error. That's what that is. And then you go through once with an addition. That gives you the upper part. You go through once with the subtraction. That's the lower part. Or you go to mini tab, stat, basic, statistics, one proportion test. Don't forget, when you're doing this, mini tab doesn't let you put in p hat. It doesn't let you put in 51%. So what you're going to have to do instead is figure out, oh, if the answer is 51% out of the 200, sorry, 829 people said, oh, this sucks, you know, you're going to have to tell me how many of those people were the ones that said it sucks. So you just take 51% times 829, and that's what's going to give you the first part of what Minitab is going to ask you. I think I'm going to do this one. Um, anyway, and that's how I got that 423 people. I took 51 times the 829 to get me what would go into mini tab. Comes out exactly the same. Fun times. Oh, hey, just remember, sometimes I'm going to ask you for the test statistic. This is a z-score. Don't think it's something that it's not. 
It's telling you how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. It's telling you, is this unusual? So if you're doing a hypothesis test and your z-score comes out negative 12, you should know that's really weird and really unusual, and it's probably not going to be good at evidence against your null hypothesis. Against, we never go against it, sorry. It's evidence against your null hypothesis. It's not a good sign that the null is true. Oh, boy. Last warning, p-value is not the same as p-hat, not the same as p. These are all different and all have different names for a reason. So be careful. P-value is the only one that's a probability. So they're different. So don't try to combine the p-value with anything else because the other two are proportions. That makes them like you can combine those. P-value itself is a probability. It's different. You cannot combine it. Is there anything else I want to say about this one? Nope. Moving on. Oh, hey, a hypothesis test. It is what it is. I don't know. I'm getting burnt out on this. Blah, blah, blah. Cars crash. People are sad. Wear a safety belt. Moving on. <laughs> I feel sorry for whoever reads this later or listens to it and is like, what the hell was she doing? Oh, OK. Oh, hey, you can do this for means as well. It's the same idea. I would say that means are suggestively just a little bit easier because there's not too many p's floating around except for the p-value. Yep. So still the same idea. What do confidence intervals do? They estimate what the mean is for the population. Hypothesis tests are you trying to determine someone's claim about what's going on with the population. So ask yourself, what's my claim? What am I trying to figure out? Set up my research hypothesis. Test that claim to see if it's reasonable using what you know with math. All of these are using the sampling distribution. Oh my god, that picture still didn't work. I tried fixing this yesterday. It didn't happen, evidently. It looks good on my computer. Failure. Anyway. So suppose the uh, population of men is normally distributed for their weight with 172 pounds. With a standard deviation of 29 pounds, don't blame me. I stole this from a medical textbook if you're a dude and you think this is wrong. Um, if we take 12 men and randomly select them and figure out how much they weigh and the average is great, we're trying to determine if the average is greater than 167. You'd set this up and see if that's true or not. Remember, live and die by the probability in the z-score. They're going to tell you, is this unusual? That's how we measure, is this unusual? Those are what you should be looking at. Nope, I, uh, the problem is if I back up, then I have to re-save the whole thing, otherwise it doesn't record it, which is horrible, so that's fun. Do we remember where the 2.01 comes from? Oh, no. If you, okay, slight pull of the audience. How many of you just plan to use Minitab to do this? All right, so for those who are listening and hate Minitab, that's from the T-table. Boing! All right, it is what it is. Um, I wanted to bring up this example because I haven't done one like this in a while. Um, <clears throat> so this is that axle load data I was using earlier, but I actually gave you the data. If I give you the data, you will have to type it into Minitab to be able to do the test. We understand that, right? I don't know. I only bring this up and you're like, oh God, she's asking us stupid questions. Um, because last year I got this question like four times when I was giving the exam. So like, you know, I feel like it's a necessary thing. So you'd have to type these, you know, six values, sorry, seven values into Minitab and then run the test using the values from the column that you had. <sighs> All right. When you do that, you get a suggestively small p-value, which tells you, oh, there's sufficient evidence to support the claim that the sample comes from a population with a mean greater than 165 pounds. Meh. This is about all I'm looking for. A couple of you, I shouldn't say this, I'm hoping what we've learned that is that in, when I'm writing a conclusion, I don't care if you failed to reject. I don't care what you think of that hoe. I care, did you answer the question posed and tell me something about what the data has shown you? Yeah? So ask yourself when you're writing your conclusion, did I answer the question? I will tell you right now, I will give you more points for answering it incorrectly if you write it in context, because you at least bothered to include what this question was about or what the situation was about. That is going to serve you more than I know statistics, because you'll be able to apply the statistics to something, which is a skill that not everyone has. Have skills that not everyone has. That's how you get a job. <laughs>